with us uh, this morning. <clears throat> this morning, uh, I wanted to present a lesson, of course, uh, as we consider the freedom that we have, uh, because that's what's on our mind at this point in the year, every year. Uh, but I really want us to focus this morning on the freedom uh, that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, all too often, as, as uh, Christians, we struggle with the side of our nature that wants to uh, uh, maybe improve on rules and regulations. Somehow, for some reason, we are drawn towards the ideas of, of rules. We're drawn towards the idea of, of uh, regulating behavior and, and, and trying to improve even on the things that God has taught us and that He has given to us as His expectation. Uh, the message of Christ, though, it isn't a message for the unmoved. This message isn't for the apathetic. The, the fact is, the message of New Testament Christianity cannot be forced into some kind of, uh, of temple-modeled religion, uh, old law-modeled religion, uh, where there are specific things that are, are said and done and, and specific things that uh, people are held accountable for in the way of their very lives in this life on earth. So no matter how much we try to force it, no matter how much we try to impose our own ideas, we need to back up sometimes and look at the perfect law of liberty that we have been given, that has been delivered to us from Jesus Christ. Here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he tells us that a little leaven, verse 9, I'm sorry, he tells us a little leaven leavens the whole lump because it only takes a small dose of the wrong thing to corrupt the whole thing. As Christians, especially at this time of the year for us as a, uh, Christian Americans, we need to focus our minds, our hearts on the freedom in Jesus Christ. Really, I, I want you to take responsibility. I guess the goal of my sermon this morning is to encourage you to take responsibility for your faith. And as we examine the the things that the Holy Spirit tells us here in Galatians chapter 5, I think that each of us individually should compare our faith to the faith that we read about in the Bible. So this morning, first, read along with me there in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 1 again. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You see, he starts off encouraging us to move to freedom. And who he's specifically talking to here are, are the Greeks who, uh, after Paul had preached the gospel to them and he had moved on to another area, uh, some came in, Jewish Christians, who, who thought that Christianity was just part of the same Thing they had known their whole lives. And instead of, of recognizing that Jesus had brought a brand new thing to the world, uh, they imposed the restrictions and the expectations of Judaism onto the new Greek Christians. So they told them, hey, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to uh, follow these old laws and these old ways as you implement the new ways also. It's something that you add to it. <clears throat> Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says no. No, 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 that, that's not what it is. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, he seems very passionate as we go through pretty much all of his letters to the churches. Uh, he's passionate about making the point that Christianity is different from the old law, that there's a big difference. And who better to explain that than Paul? He, he was a Pharisee. He knew the old law backwards and forwards. He knew it well. He could teach it. He could explain it <clears throat> And God uses him here uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to explain to even us as Christians who are removed by thousands of years to look at this and say, you know what, we need to make sure we are holding to the faith of the New Testament, that we are truly a New Testament church, that we're individually New Testament Christians following the way of Christ rather than the ways of the old law. You see, the way of Christ is completely different from the old law. I tell you, I've heard a, a lot of different sermons on these ideas and, and a lot of different people talking about these things. And some of the things that I want to present to you in this sermon this morning, uh, the thoughts and ideas I'm borrowing uh, from a preacher named Andy Stanley. And I think he did a wonderful job in pointing out the differences between the old law and the new law. And I want to give you a few examples uh, that I heard him give. 
You know, in the old law, there were sacred places. There were sacred places. You had the temple or or the tabernacle before the temple. And you had priests who would go into the holy of holies, right? Uh, This special place where only special things could be done because you were in the presence of God. He says, this is special. This is sacred. These are sacred places. And in almost any religion of men uh, that you see in this whole world, you'll recognize there are these ideas of sacred places. Sacred places where you have to go in order to receive whatever it is, uh, the, the blessing or whatever it is that you want to receive. But Jesus turns this upside down. In John chapter 4 and verse 19, he's speaking with a woman at the well, and this woman is a Samaritan woman. And so she isn't uh, considered uh, a Jewish woman. She's not a part of the, the family uh, of Abraham of the old law. And yet Jesus speaks to her. And during their conversation, as he has spoken to her, the woman in verse 19 says, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Because he's told her things about herself. And so she recognizes there's something special about him. And then she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. She says, I know that there's sacred ground. I know that there is sacred places. But Jesus says to her in verse 21, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, and we worship what uh, we know. For salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is. Listen, the hour is coming and now is. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and And in truth, Jesus says, listen, the days are gone of holy places, of of sacred spots on this earth. You will never stand anywhere, you'll never be in a more sacred place than the person, than, than being beside the person who is next to you right now than any other person that you can stand next to. Because Jesus says, instead of there being a sacred place, now you are my sacred place. I want to dwell in your heart, and I will make your heart my home. Jesus says, now you are the holy places. You are portable temples Uh, going throughout this world, taking the message of Jesus Christ, living holy lives, the holy of holies of the Old Testament. It's moved from some sacred ground into your heart. This is where God resides. And this is where God directs you from now if you treasure His words in your heart. If you have allowed His words to make a difference, see, you'll never go anywhere that's more sacred than the person to your left or to your right. You are the temple of God. He tells us such in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He says you belong to God, and God makes his dwelling place in you. You know, under the old law, another difference between the old law and the new law, the new way of Christ, is sacred texts. Sacred texts. No longer can you be judged by how you memorize a text and recite it. No longer can you be uh, judged uh, by the, uh, the placement of words and how you place them into a sentence. No. You see in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching. And he says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then notice what he says at the end of his prayer. Jesus Christ says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
says, listen, it's not about the order of words that you say. It's not about how you go about saying these special words and somehow these special words are going to uh, do something in you. He says, it's not some, some magic prayer that you pray. There is no such thing. There's no concept throughout the New Testament anywhere that, that somehow implies that we can say this magic prayer, that we can do this magic deed. You know, we have our own version of it, don't we? When we try to make baptism something that it's not. When we think somehow that baptism is, is this one and done religion. Uh, that once I've been immersed, then I go and I do whatever I want. That's not what baptism is. That's not how this works. There's no sacred text. There's no sacred uh, way of doing things. The sacred text is the Word of God. We need to listen to what God has inspired to be said and then follow exactly His instructions for life. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And so let's follow His way instead of somehow uh, elevating our traditions, our ways, our, our things that we've thought of and making them more important than what God has actually said. Instead of inserting our own will, instead... Walking with God, listening to His will, and then allowing it to be done in our lives. Under the old law, we had sacred men. There were priests who would stand up for the people, who would make the sacrifices for the people, who would make atonement for the people. The people just needed to deliver to that priest the, uh, the, the animal. Uh, the, whatever sacrifice it was that they needed made, they would take it to the priest, and the priest would make intercession for them. These sacred men, any religion in the world you want to look at, there's sacred men who go in between the people and the God that they're worshiping. These sacred men who make choices and make decisions, who hold the keys to heaven and the keys to hell themselves. And they uh, are, are there then to dictate uh, the rights and the manners and the things that must be done by the people. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Such a, a, a difference, such a contrast between him living in our hearts and our hearts being far from him because we choose to follow traditions of men rather than the ways of Christ. He says, they worship me. in vain they worship me, in verse 9, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. I want to follow the blind. I don't want you to follow the blind. I don't want you to somehow think uh, that, well, I'll ask the preacher what I believe. When someone says, hey, why do you do this? Why do you think this? I don't want you to say, well, uh, let me call the preacher. That's not what I'm here for. I'm just like you. I'm just a guy. I'm struggling to understand the will of God and put it to practice in my life, as you must be doing also. As each of us grow closer to God and we become the people that he desires us to be. The fact is, your relationship with God has much less to do with me or our elders or our deacons than it does with you establishing a relationship with Jesus Christ. Than it has with you opening up the pages of your Bible and listening to the words of God. You need to move into freedom rather than being held back by the ways of the old law. Uh, rather than somehow saying, you know what, <clears throat> I like the way they did it back then. I'm going to let somebody else answer for me. It doesn't work. We'll each give an account of ourselves to God on the day of judgment. I won't be there to answer for you, and you won't be there to answer for me. Mama won't be there to answer for us. No one, just ourselves and the judge and the justifier, Jesus Christ. So are we developing our relationship with Him, or are we somehow trying to, to follow someone who we decided is some sacred man? Some special person that we think we need to follow instead of following Christ. You see, the old law, the old way of doing things is over. Jesus nailed it to the cross and he's removed it out of our way. 
He tells us in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, in him, this is Jesus, in him you were also circumcised, notice, with the circumcision made without hands. He uses this Old Testament idea, this Old Testament uh, identification, all right, circumcision, uh, to remind them that in Christ they have a better way. That in Christ it's not about the physical so much as it is about the spiritual and to keep their mind on the spiritual things. He says, by putting off the body of, sin, of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the working of God, who raised Jesus from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He says, listen, you're free. You're free in Christ. Why would you go back to the bondage of the old ways? And then he reminds us, you know what, if you're going to go back, you've got to keep it all. That's what he's telling us there in verse 3. He says, listen, if you're going to try to uh, bind one part of the old law, then you're going to have to keep all of it. So Christian, my encouragement is don't bind the old law. Don't come up with new rules and new regulations that are really just old rules and old regulations. Don't add to what God has said. Rather, do what God has said. Because you are free in Christ and you need to move into the freedom that Christ offers. Christ is offering you grace. So move into His grace. Move into the grace of the new covenant with God. Notice with me verses 3 and 4 in Galatians chapter 5. It says, I testify again, every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. And then he says, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. I don't want to fall from grace. I know that you don't want to fall from grace. I know you want to live in the grace of God. But the fact is, as we said before, it only takes a small dose of the wrong thing to corrupt the whole thing. In James uh, chapter 2, in James chapter 2 and verse 10, he reminds us again, if you're going to try to keep the old law, then you're going to have to keep all of the old law if you're going to try to uh, somehow improve on what god is doing in the new covenant you're only going to ruin what he has done for you under the new covenant instead of going glorying in our own ability to get things right trying to improve on what god has taught us instead glory in the righteousness of christ you know in first corinthians chapter 5 uh, verse 6 He's writing, of course, to a church that has decided to celebrate uh, immorality. A church that has looked at a member that is among them and said, hey, you know what, your sin is okay. We're just going to overlook that and we're just going to be happy about it. We're going to glorify uh, you and, and, and your sin and we're going to live with it. We're not going to deal with it as Jesus has taught us to. We're just going to uh, decide to overlook those things. We're just not, not going to deal with that. He says to them in verse 6, 1 Corinthians 5, your glorying is not good. You know, when God looks at a Christian and says, your glorying is not good, that Christian ought to stand up and take notice, shouldn't he? He should really listen carefully to what he says, because we love to glorify. We love to give glory. The singing this morning has been beautiful, and there's no doubt in my mind that it brings glory to the name of God. But he tells this group, he says, your glorying is not good. Because they were glorifying sin. They were glorifying something other than what should have been glorified in Christ. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Says, listen, Jesus told us that the truth would set us free. And so don't then turn back to some old way or don't construct some uh, way that looks like the old way that then removes your responsibility to God. 
Because when you do this, you're becoming estranged from Christ. Uh, No longer does Christ recognize you because you've fallen from grace. Uh, Because you've looked at his grace and you said, you know what, I need more. I I want something different. I'm not going to follow your way. I'm going to do it my way. See, this leaven thinking always focuses on oneself rather than focusing on Jesus Christ. The integrity of our horizontal relationships among one another will determine the strength of our vertical relationship with the judge. Until we start treating one another in the correct manner, until we love one another as Jesus taught us in his new commandment that he gave in John 13, 34, and 35, until we truly love one another as he has loved us, and until we love each other enough to say, brother, you're wrong. Sister, stop doing that. You're going to lose access to the grace of God by following a way of sin. You see, until we love one another enough to stand up for the truth and to guide one another in the righteousness of Christ, we're only going to be binding things and traditions and following after an old system that Jesus nailed to the cross and that is not with us anymore. He says, no, I want you to love one another. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23, Jesus said, if you bring your gift to the altar, and while you're there, you remember that your brother has something against you. You leave your gift there before the altar, and you go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Why is he saying this? He says, listen, I want you to take care of one another. I want you to look after one another. I want you to recognize that, that when you have come into Christ, when He has washed your sins away, that you are right with God, that your sins have been forgiven, that God is for you. It doesn't take much of a reading in Romans uh, chapter 8 to recognize God is for you. He, he said, I've sent my Son for you. God is for you. When someone dies to save you, I would say they are for you, wouldn't you? They want you. God wants you, and he's for you. And what he says now is, I want you to make sure you're for your brothers and sisters. I want you to make sure you're for those who are outside. He says, I want you to look after one another, and that you would treat one another with the same love, with the same respect that you want to be treated with. So do unto others as you would have them do to you. So as you enjoy the grace of God, You, Christian, are to impart that grace to others also. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all this, put on love, which is the bond of perfection which is the bond of perfection. In verse 13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He says, listen, it's about your treatment of one another. It's about how you love one another. And if you're not going to love each other, if you're not going to treat one another in the way that I've taught, you've fallen from grace, you've become estranged from Christ. Because the way of Christ is love. The way of Christ is serving one another in love. And if we refuse to serve one another in in love, if we somehow think uh, that I'm going to use the liberty that I've been given in Christ to do something other than what Christ has set me free to do, it says you're messing up. You're falling back under that old way. You're you're trying to uh, bring back an old way of thinking. No, instead, let's remember the new covenant we have. And the greatest commands that he gave us in that covenant. In Mark 12, verse 30 and 31, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. He says, you know, the thing that we're going to keep from the old law, the only thing we're going to keep from the old law, I want you to remember who God is, and I want you to love each other. I want you to love God, and I want you to love one another. This is moving to grace. Let me ask you a couple questions. Have you ever felt more guilty over missing a church service 
than you felt over mistreating another person? You're living then like you're under the old law. You're trying to use old leaven in a new faith, and it's not going to work. Stop and help that person who's on the side of the road, even if it's going to make you late for church. He says, you, you leave your gift at the altar and you go serve one another. You go help one another first. He says, listen, I want you to care for one another first. I want you to show your love, because when I show my love to you, I'm showing my love to God. Matthew chapter 25. Jesus makes it extremely clear. If you visit those who are sick, if you visit those who are in prison, if you feed the hungry, if you give drink to the thirsty, you've done it to me. He says, listen, I want you to make sure you're taking care of one another. Stop and help that person. Stop and make things right with the one that you've been screaming at. Because these are leaven thinking. These are are old leaven trying to be mixed into a, a new faith, and it's just not going to work. At a time when you failed morally, maybe your anger got the best of you. Maybe you really just laid into someone who, who, who obviously did something wrong, but you used it as an occasion to really unleash your anger on them. Maybe it's a, an affair. Maybe you uh, have, have failed morally because you've allowed your passion and your lust to control your actions, and you've fallen into a sinful way of living. Maybe it's apathy. Apathy in the life of a Christian who just looks at the world and says, ah, they're going to be all right anyway. And just gives up on any idea of trying to serve or, or trying to, to pray with them or trying to serve them and trying to lift them up out of this worldly way of living and into the way of Christ. This is leaven thinking. Were you more concerned when you had that moral failure? Were you more concerned about what God was going to do to you? Or were you more concerned about how what you did to that person is going to affect them. Think about it. When you've done wrong to someone else, uh, is the first thought that comes to your mind, oh, God's going to really get me for this. I, I better make sure I get to church Sunday. When you wake up on, uh, after, after a night of, of wrong and sin, you think, oh, God's going to be so angry with me. Or do you think about the person who you wronged? Maybe the person who you're influenced, encouraged to, to take a drink of something that's only going to impair their judgment and lead them into even worse decisions. Do you think about that person or do you think about what God's going to do to you? Because if you're still thinking about what God's going to do to you, you're still thinking about you. Who's at the center of that religion? Who's at the center of that faith? You. What am I going to do? How is God going to treat me? Jesus says, listen, this is a new thing. And when you treat others in a way that is unbecoming a Christian, you need to be concerned about them. You need to be concerned about their soul. You need to make sure you go to them and make things right so that they don't somehow think this is the way of Christ. Because it's not. It's not the way of Christ to treat people ugly when you're angry. To unleash your anger on them. It's not the way of Christ to to live in a a way of of sexual promiscuity and to to have an affair, to to follow after someone who is not your own. This, This is not the way of Christ. You make things right. You repent of these things and you turn away from them. It's equally not right for us to have an apathetic attitude towards the lost. To not cry for their lostness. To not desire to bring them closer to the God who loves them so much. These are all leaven thinking. And this horizontal relationship problem is creating a vertical relationship problem. And until I correct this relationship problem I have with others, I'm going to continue messing up the relationship I have with God. Last one, if, if you've ever worried about the eternal destiny of your child, if you've thought, oh, I hope my child makes it through the day. I hope my, my, my little boy, my little girl is, is going to go to heaven because I, I'm not sure if they're safe or not. Jesus put that, that worry to rest. In Matthew 19, he tells us, let the children come to me. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. He says, you want to go to heaven? You need to be like them because they're all going to heaven. They're pure. They're innocent. They're right in his eyes. And let me go one step further. If you grew up, under a system that said somehow this child is not innocent, somehow this child is not right before God, and you learned from that and then lived according to that way, rewind and accept the freedom in Christ and move to grace. 
Instead of following after these old ways, these old procedures, this leaven thinking, rid your mind of it and follow Christ in His grace. Move to grace. Move into Christ. There in Galatians chapter 5, verse 5, it says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Listen to that. It says, but faith working through love. The NIV translates it like this. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Rid your mind of all these things, all these barriers, all this leavened thinking that you've allowed in. And love one another. Serve one another. Because the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. If you cannot truly say with the faithful, come Lord Jesus. If you're not looking forward to His return. If you're not eagerly waiting for the hope of Jesus' return. You need to re-examine what you're doing. You see, our devotion to God is illustrated, demonstrated, and authenticated by our love for others. And until we realize this and behave in such a way that we comply with it, We're going to move further and further away from Him. You must put your faith in Jesus as the Son of God. You must repent of the sin that has separated you from God. Confessing Jesus as the Son of God and being immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. You can be in Christ. There's two passages in all of the New Testament that tell us how to get into Christ. Both teach us that we're baptized into Christ. And neither one of them say that it's a one-time deal. Neither one of them say that this is just something that you do one time and then you go and live however you want. Both of them express to us that it's a way of life from then on. Just as confession isn't just a one-time thing that says, yeah, I believe in Jesus. It's a confession that goes on and on and on every day by the way you live your life in front of other people. A great restoration preacher named J.W. McGarvey said it like this, freedom consists in conformity to that which in the realm of intellect is called truth. And in the realm of morality is called law. The only way to know truth is to obey it. And God's truth gives freedom from sin and from death. I want to encourage you. Christian, if you've allowed leaven thinking to cloud your judgment, if you've allowed leaven thinking to to creep into your faith and to, to keep you back from the grace of God, rid yourself of those things and come to Christ. Repenting of your sin and making things right with your Father who loves you so much. He desires for you now to express that love to others. If you're not a Christian, I encourage you, find freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom from sin and death is the only place you'll find it. In Christ Jesus the Lord. Whatever your need is, won't you come while we stand and we sing this song?